ஒன் பாடி வித் எனதர் பாடி எலக்ட்ரான்ஸ் ஆர் டிரான்ஸ்போர்ட் ஃப்ரம் டு ஃப்ரம் ஒன் ஆப்ஜெக்ட் டு வாட் எனதர் ஆப்ஜெக்ட் ஓகே திஸ் ப்ராசஸ் திஸ் டைப் ஆஃப் எலக்ட்ரிசிட்டி இஸ் பீன் கிவன் அ நேம் halogen connected carbon sp3 then it's connected to benzene see all of you halogen connected what is this carbon hybridization full single bond sp3 see then a benzene ring denominator poles shouldn't be included in the the denominator poles that means the denominator these minus 1 and minus 5 should never be included should be included in the solution homo circle caudal fin it's giving two equal lobes but in case of cartilage which is look at here one big lobe is there one small lobe is there you cannot cut into two equal half this fin Hi all. Today I am going to discuss some questions as well as some topics from ecosystem as well as organism and population chapter. So we will go through all the topics given in NCRT one by one along with a few questions. So let me start with the first question. Which one of the following is not a correct match of the term and its description? So first of all let me tell about an ecosystem. ecosystem you already know it's the structural and functional unit of nature where you can see there is an interaction between living organism and its physical environment that is what we call it as ecosystem so first that is given is correct only then second global ecosystem this entire biosphere is an ecosystem where you can see there is an interaction between so many living organism as well as the abiotic substance that is coming in the environment so second statement is also correct or second what is given is also correct then aquatic ecosystem one example is wetland we can divide this entire biosphere into small small ecosystem because learning the entire biosphere is not that easy that is the reason this entire biosphere can be divided into small small ecosystem which will be including natural ecosystem as well as man made ecosystem in the natural ecosystem further it can be divided into terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem terrestrial ecosystem you may be knowing about the forest grasslands etc and the aquatic ecosystem again into the fresh water and the marine ecosystem like that this entire biosphere is an ecosystem so learning the entire biosphere is not so easy that is why we divide it into small small ecosystems so here the first three that is given is correct but crop field is not an example of natural ecosystem crop field is an example of man made ecosystem so hope you got what is an ecosystem is the place of interaction of biotic and abiotic component and it is the structural and functional unit of nature and the term ecosystem was coined by the scientist who coined the term ecosystem is ag tansley Now next question vertical distribution of different species occupying different levels in a dense vegetation is called that is actually called the arrangement of different plant community in vertically in a vegetation a dense forest and all that is called stratification so if you take a dense forest you can see the upper portion is occupied by large trees like this very large trees will be occupying the upper portion then the second layer will be occupied by some small tree then you can see the next occupying is what again small tree then shrubs then herbs like this the vertical distribution of these different plants that is coming in a dense forest 
that is actually called as stratification hope you understood what is stratification now let's move on to the next question which one of the following aspect is not a component of functional unit of an ecosystem functioning of an ecosystem if you are taking there are mainly four functions that is coming in an ecosystem the first function is productivity so what is productivity rate of production of biomass is actually called productivity so an ecosystem if it is functioning or if it is ha it has to uh, continue there should be some productivity in the ecosystem there should be production of biomass in the ecosystem so first option is correct only it's actually a functional aspect of ecosystem then second one decomposition in the ecosystem this all biomass should again get recycled after death of the organism so decomposition is also coming under the functioning of an ecosystem System. then there should be an energy flow between the producers consumers and all and energy should flow in an ecosystem between different trophic level that is actually taking place through nutrient cycling and ecological pyramid it's actually not the functioning of an ecosystem we make ecological pyramid in order to understand whether the ecosystem is growing properly or it is functioning properly etc that only we make ecological pyramid which is a graphical representation of different trophic levels coming in the food chains of an ecosystem so fourth one is not a functional aspect of an ecosystem hope you got it now let's move to decomposition let's have a discussion what is decomposition it's an important topic that is coming from ecosystem this diagram is given in ncrt you may be knowing the different steps that are coming under decomposition so what is the first step that is coming in decomposition the first step in decomposition is fragmentation after death of an organism you can see whether it is plants or animals the dead remains only we call it as what the dead remain is actually called as detritus with the help of detrivores in the top soil you can see this detritus will be broken down into small small pieces that is done by some detrivores like earthworm and all so detrivores can actually degrade this detritus into small small pieces or fragments this process only we call it as this process only we call it as what fragmentation this process only is called fragmentation so when they are broken into like this small small pieces you can see some minerals will be coming out of that these minerals will be percolating deep into the soil horizon so deep into the soil they will start percolating and going along with the water that process is the second that is called leaching that process is called as leaching then whatever is remaining again they will be broken down into small small pieces by bacteria and fungi using some enzyme so proteins can be broken into amino acid sugars the polysaccharide into sugars like that it will be broken further by some bacteria and fungi this process is called catabolism what is the process called catabolism catabolism is done by some bacteria and fungi using some enzymes they will be doing this process this is actually called as catabolism so what are the various steps associated with decomposition first of all there is a detritus you can see the detritus is broken down into small small pieces by detrivores the process is called fragmentation after that the minerals that are coming out sometimes it will be mixing with the water and it will be going into the deep horizon it percolate into the deep horizon the process is actually called as what the leaching then whatever is left out again it will be digested by some bacteria fungi etc producing some enzyme that process is called as catabolism the process is called catabolism then whatever is left out now they started forming some dark colored amorphous substance they will be turning into some dark colored amorphous substance which cannot be digested further so from that slowly only minerals will be released out that dark colored amorphous substance that will be found in the top soil that is actually called humus the process of formation of humus is called as humification this process is called as humification 
that is the fourth step so what is the fourth step in decomposition humification is the fourth step that is coming in decomposition then from the humus slowly slowly some minerals are released into the soil with time so suddenly it won't be released this will be present in the top soil as available salt whereas through leaching so many mineral minerals has percolated deep into the soil what is that mineralization that is unavailable salt whereas these which are available in the top soil and which is available to the plants that are present in the top soil this process only we call it as this process is the last process this is actually called mineralization this is called as mineralization hope you got it so these are the five steps that are coming in decomposition first step is uh, fragmentation where the detritus is broken down into small small pieces of fragments by the detrivores second you can see this detritus will be further acted upon by some bacteria or fungi producing some enzyme and breaking them that process is catabolism at that time minerals that are percolating into the deep horizon that is unavailable to the plants in the top strata that is actually called as leaching then whatever is actually formed will turn into a dark colored amorphous substance that is humus the process is called humification then after the humus formation slowly slowly minerals will start coming out of that that is available to the topsoil and it will be available to the plants that is actually called mineralization so these are the five steps that are given in NCRT so this diagram when you are learning you have to learn that decomposition now let's move to the next question the movement of energy from lower to higher trophic level is always unidirectional movement of energy in a food chain in the ecosystem is always unidirectional and they also obey the 10 percent law only 10 percent of energy will keep on moving from one trophic level to another so if you are drawing an ecological pyramid for the energy that is present in a food chain and all it's always upright pyramid the pyramid of energy is always upright next one read the given statement and select the correct option net primary productivity is less than gross primary productivity so let me tell about gross primary and net primary what is primary productivity the production of biomass by the plants that is called primary productivity by performing photosynthesis and in an year in a given area in a time period how much biomass they are producing in a unit time is called as gross primary productivity so in a given area the plants that are growing they will be performing photosynthesis and they actually make a lot of biomass that actually is called as gross primary productivity and after producing for example just assumption i am telling they are producing 100 glucose that is gross primary productivity suppose they are using 50 out of that for respiration then what is left is called net primary productivity so gross primary productivity minus respiratory loss is called as net primary productivity so that is correct net primary productivity is always less than gross primary productivity so what is gross primary productivity the productivity of biomass by the plants by performing photosynthesis in a time in a unit time in a given area that is called gross primary productivity then what is left after respiratory loss is called as net primary productivity then second net primary productivity is equal to gross primary productivity minus respiratory loss so both the statements that are given here is correct hope you got it next one biomass available for consumption by the herbivores and decomposers is so the biomass that is available to the herbivores means the one which is available from the producers after the respiratory loss that is net primary productivity then what is standing crop this is always asked question standing crop and standing state in a particular area in a particular time period how much biomass is produced is called as standing crop whereas inorganic components of minerals that is present is called standing state so amount of nutrients that is present in a soil in a given time is called standing state whereas biomass that is present is called as standing crop 
then let me conclude about secondary productivity also what is secondary productivity primary productivity means biomass production by the plants after consuming the plants how much biomass is produced in the animal is called as secondary productivity so hope you got the three terms what is primary productivity gross primary productivity net primary productivity secondary productivity so primary productivity is the biomass production by the plant and in an year how much they are producing that is called gross primary productivity and what is left in them after respiratory loss that is called net primary productivity and after consuming the plants how much biomass is produced in the animals and all that is actually called as secondary productivity Anyway, remember the lines in NCRT about the 170 billion tons of biomass produced in the biosphere. You should understand very less percentage of biomass is produced in the ocean, even though they are covering 70% of the earth's surface. Maximum biomass production is in the terrestrial ecosystem only. Now, next is percentage of photosynthetically active radiation in the incident solar radiation try to understand out of the total incident light only less than 50 percent of the light is only taken by the sorry less than 50 percent of that is only the photosynthetically active radiation so photosynthetically active radiation you should understand it is the visible light which is having a wavelength of 400 to 700 nanometer this light is only used by the plants for performing photosynthesis so percentage of photosynthetically active radiation if you are taking it's less than 50 percent of the total solar radiation and from that only 2 to 10 percent is used up by the plants so visible light is only less than 50 percent above the 700 nanometer you know it is infrared below the 400 nanometer it is ultraviolet and all that is not used by the plants only this wavelength of light is used by the plants for performing photosynthesis that is actually called photosynthetically active radiation in that less than 50 percent only is the photosynthetically active radiation and in that itself the radiation or the wavelength of light that is used by the plants uh, they will take only 2 to 10 percent of this visible light entire light is not taken by the plants next question given figure represent two food chain interconnected food chain is also called food web so let's see what is given here here x is starting with x and y is given x is starting with a leaf and this food chain is taken moth or caterpillar is eating that it is eaten by a insectivorous bird that is eaten by a hawk so x is surely a grazing food chain whereas you can see a dead leaf is coming in the y so a food chain starting with the dead remains of some organism that is detritus food chain that is detritus food chain remember majority of the terrestrial food chain is detritus food chain whereas aquatic food chain if you are taking majority you can see grazing food chain it is just opposite only then what is detritus food chain the food chain that start with dead remains of organism is called as detritus food chain then what is a a can be a detrivore only which is eaten by some uh, organism anyway detritus food chain also will be later joining the grace, uh, grazing food chain so here the option c next question if 10 joules of energy is available at the producer level then amount of energy present at the level of secondary consumer here you have to apply 10 percent low so you know what is 10 percent low only 10 percent of energy will be moving from one trophic level to the next trophic level remaining will be lost as heat that is 10 percent low proposed by linman so here if the producer is having 10 joules of energy so first trophic level is what first trophic level you can see there is primary producer usually it will be including the plants and all here it is given they have only 10 joules of energy then only 10 percent of this will be passing to the next trophic level so which is the second trophic level second trophic level will be primary consumer usually primary consumer is which organism primary consumer is herbivores and you can see only one joule of energy will be going to that then the next trophic level that will be coming the third trophic level that will be coming is secondary consumer the third trophic level is secondary consumer which will be 
the primary carnivores which will be getting only 0.1 joule of energy so the answer is this then next trophic level will be what the tertiary consumer that will be secondary carnivore that will be the fourth trophic level that will be getting 0 0.01 joules of energy anyway next trophic level and all much energy won't be reaching that is the recent trophic level is reduced to maximum four or five so you should have an idea about this anyway the fifth one will be the top consumer that will be tertiary carnivore so this is actually a pyramid of energy we started with 10 joules only 10 percent of that is going to the next trophic level this was uh, proposed by Linman, the 10 percent low next one which of the following representation show the pyramid of numbers in a forest ecosystem in a forest ecosystem always the pyramid of number is upright so you can go for this one whereas if it is a pond ecosystem it will be having an inverted pyramid trophic level one will be phytoplankton two will be zooplankton and three will be the small fishes four will be large fishes an inverted pyramid of biomass can be observed in the aquatic ecosystem so aquatic ecosystem and all you can see it will be having a uh, pyramid of biomass that will be inverted pyramid of number will be upright for forest ecosystem as well as the pond ecosystem but pyramid of biomass if you are taking it is inverted for aquatic ecosystem so that is an exception then tree ecosystem it will be a irregular pyramid or a spindle shaped pyramid you will be getting for pyramid of number so exceptions you have to learn first one pyramid of energy is always upright in any ecosystem pyramid of number upright in the forest ecosystem pond ecosystem but tree ecosystem it is irregular then if you are taking pyramid of biomass it is upright for a forest ecosystem but it is inverted for a aquatic ecosystem this much you have to remember now passing to the next question this is auto syllabus robert constanza ecosystem services that was given in previous ncrt so what is the amount of average price tag on nature nature's life support services determined by robert constanza robert constanza was a scientist who was actually calculating the price of each and everything that we are getting free from the nature like the weathering of rocks or else the purification of air he started just putting some basic prices for all these that we are getting free from the nature that is called ecosystem services and what he understood is the amount that is coming for the free things that we are getting from the nature is around us dollar 33 trillion an year so this is robert constanza next one find an incorrect statement for detritus food chain you already know what is detritus food chain the food chain that is starting with the mm. detritus or dead remains of plants and animals that is called as detritus food chain this dead remains of plants and animals are actually fragmented by the detrivores and this detrivores are eaten by some organism so a detritus food chain will be starting with the detritus majority majority of the terrestrial food chain is a detritus food chain so here it start with solar energy the first statement itself is wrong so solar energy that you will be starting with the grazing food chain only remaining all terminates in grazing food chain then requires specific detrivores plays major role in terrestrial system because it help in nutrient recycling and all next one which is not true for humus you know what is humus in the beginning we have discussed about the decomposition the first step is fragmentation where you can see the detritus was broken down into small small pieces or fragments after that you can see each piece or fragment will be acted upon by some bacteria and fungus during this uh, fragmentation some minerals are released out that mixes with the water and percolate into the deep ho soil horizon that process only we call it as leaching then whatever is available in the topsoil that will be further acted upon by bacteria and fungus that will be broken down into again small small pieces that is catabolism and this substance turn into a dark colored amorphous material that is called humus that humus is highly resistant to uh, microbial action and it is dark colored it is a reservoir of nutrients and increase water holding capacity of the soil from that only so slowly you can see the minerals are released out they are not produced by mineralization they are actually produced by humification so the fourth statement is going wrong next one nutrient immobilization 
you should understand so many nutrients are getting stuck inside the body of microorganism and all on their death only these minerals are returned back into the soil so like that the so much nutrients will be stuck inside the organism the process is called nutrient immobilization so it prevents leaching of nutrients because it is stuck inside the microorganism then it is incorporation of nutrients in microbes that is also correct and it will be released only when they are dying and it is covalent linking of nutrients with one another that is wrong so more than one option is correct regarding nutrient immobilization hope you got it with that i am winding up ecosystem chapter now let's start with the next one organism and population hope i have gone through all the topics coming in ecosystem next is organism and population what does the shape of the given age pyramid reflect about growth status status of a population so we can divide a population into three age group pre reproductive reproductive and post reproductive pre reproductive means you know that that is between 0 to 10 and it include only those organ uh, those people who have in reached the reproductive phase of their life then the reproductive age group and the post reproductive so like that the human population can be divided into three so what does this graphs represent so first one it is a pyramid of expanding population if the pre reproductive age group is more in number than the reproductive and post reproductive that is a expanding pyramid then second one if the pre reproductive and reproductive age groups are coming same then it is a stable population and c it is a declining so the same ncrt diagram this you have to go through about the expanding stable and declining population so based on the age distribution of individuals we can plot a population like this and we can divide it into three types of population expanding population stable population and the declining now next one if n equal population density at time t then population density at time t1 can be written as so here you know about this equation if you want to calculate what is the population density after a particular time period for example initially the population is 1000 individual in uh, a time or in the given time it was 1000 so after one year you want to check what is the increase in population so what you should do is you have to check how many birth is occurring in the population that is called as natality number of birth occurring in the population is called natality then how many individuals are entering into the population that is called as immigration so this you have to add with the existing for example if 50 persons or 50 newborns are coming and 50 individuals have entered into the population so after time t1 what is the population density we are going to check previously it was thousand after one year how much it is then just imagine c can be mortality mortality means let there be around 10 uh, death is occurring as well as 10 people have exited the population that is emigration so like this just check the number of birth number of death number of immigrants number of emigrants and just you have to apply in this equation so you may be able to understand how much is the population density after time t1 so here you will be getting around 80 so here it is 1080 will be the new population density this is how you can use it now let's check what is given here in the option a can be mortality b can be natality a can be mortality b can be natality that is wrong then b can be immigration and c can be natality a b can be immigration and c can be natality that is also wrong then c can be mortality and d can be immigration d can be c can be mortality and d can be immigration no it is immigration a can be natality d can be immigration so d option is actually correct hope you got it now next one 
So this is the population growth you should be knowing about natality, mortality, immigration and emigration. So it is given by B, D, I, E. So the equation uh, you should know natality is actually given by B that is birth then mortality is given by D then immigration by I, emigration by E. Now next one which of the following factors influence population density under normal condition normal condition if you want to check the population density you have to check the number of death and the emigration so how much people are dying as well as how much people are exiting the population you have to check under normal condition so it is both a and c next one in a population per capita birth rate is 0.15 and death rate is 0.8 what is the value of r you know what is r intrinsic rate of natural increase is r so if you want to know the population density at time t dn by dt you should actually use rn so r actually represent what the intrinsic rate of natural increase that is birth minus death so here birth minus death 0.15 minus 0.8 you will be getting 0 0.07 that is r that is the intrinsic rate of natural increase next one the birth and death rate of four countries are given below which one will have the least population growth rate so let's see different countries growth rate birth rate is 15 death rate is 1000 so r is equal to birth minus death here we will get 10 then here here also you will be getting 15 then here you will be getting 17 birth minus death rate birth rate minus death rate then here you will be getting only 7 so the one which is having least population growth rate that is least uh, intrinsic rate of natural increase that is observed in S. So the country that show the least rate of increase is S. Hope you are getting it. Now let's move to the next topic that is. So you might have seen in NCRT regarding the population growth curve and all. So here A is representing exponential growth. So exponential growth will be J shaped. It will be seen only in which type of population? The population where there is a lot of resource availability. Unlimited space and resources are available. That type of population you can see they will be growing, uh, growing exponentially and they will show a J shaped growth curve. And this equation only we were using for the last few questions dn by dt equal rn where r represent intrinsic rate of natural increase. Then logistic growth. Where you can see first there is a lag phase the population grows slowly then there is an exponential phase or log phase whereas acceleration of growth can be observed then slowly they will start decelerating or stationary phase is there because they are reaching a carrying capacity so here k represent carrying capacity maximum capacity that an ecosystem can provide for the uh, development of an organism or multiplication of an organism that is carrying capacity so here the equation is dn by dt equal rn multiplied by k minus n by k k represent carrying capacity so these are the two types of growth that are seen anyway majority you can see only logistic growth exponential growth occurs very very rarely because there is no ecosystem where the resources are unlimited now next one refer to the given table if plus sign has been assigned for beneficial interaction and minus sign for detrimental interaction and zero for neutral interaction that is neither harm or nor benefited identify the type of interaction 1 2 and 3 and select the correct option so what is 1 representing 1 you can see both of them are harmed species a as well as the species b is getting harmed 
so one represents surely so type of interaction between two population or individuals where both are getting harmed that is actually competition that is actually competition then the type of interaction where you can see one is benefited and the other is harmed that can be predation in predation you can see one organism will be harming the other so one will be benefited and other will be harmed even the same happens in commensalism also so it can be predation or commensalism then last one sorry predation or parasitism not commensalism it can be predation or parasitism so in parasitism only you can see the parasite will be benefited but the other one will be affected so predation and parasitism one is benefited and the other is affected then last one one is benefited and the other is unaffected one is benefited and the other is unaffected that is commensalism hope you got the answer that is both b and c it can be competition predation or parasitism then commensalism so both are actually correct both b and c option so let me move to the next topic so this chart that is given in ncrt that is very very important you have to learn it so in mutualism you should understand both the species are actually getting benefited so many examples are there that i will be going through then competition where you can see uh, both are harmed in competition both the individuals are harmed and in predation the predator is benefited prey is getting harmed then in parasitism parasite is benefited and the host is harmed then in commensalism one is benefited other is unaffected then amensalism one is harmed other is unaffected so these are the different type of population interaction we will go through all the different types of population interaction now let me start with the next question which of the following is an advantage of predation whenever there is predation only it serves as a conduit for energy transfer across trophic level when there is predation there is movement of energy from one trophic level to the next especially from the herbivores to primary carnivore from the primary carnivore to the secondary carnivore like that you can see there is transfer of energy that is taking place then it takes place in a population of organism of lower trophic level under control so it keeps actually population of those or prey population will be under control just imagine if all the predators are removed what will happen to the population of the prey the prey population will start increasing tremendously and what will happen is if the primary carnivore is removed you can see herbivores numbers will increase and the producers number will start decreasing like that there can be ecological imbalance that can happen due to the uh, removal of predators so it's actually very important in order to keep the prey population or the lower trophic levels under control then predators help in maintaining species diversity in a community by reducing the intensity of competition so because of the predators you can see the prey population the competitions will be less because they are controlling the prey populations number also if they are increasing a lot there can be competition among the prey populations also so all these are actually advantages of a predation now next question read the following statement and select the correct option prickly pear cactus introduced into australia in early 1920s cause havoc by spreading rapidly into millions of hectares so this cactus plan was introduced in australia what happened is like the water has been spreading in our country this cactus also was spreading everywhere in australia then when certain exotic species are introduced into a geographical area they become invasive and start spreading fast because the invaded land does not have its natural predator this is the biggest problem if you are bringing an exotic species its predator also should be there otherwise without the predator this prey population will increase a lot 
this was happening in australia so later they were introducing the predator of certain moths so this is the diagram of prickly pear cactus that was introduced in australia and it multiplied everywhere in australia and causing a havoc later some moths or insects were introduced that will be feeding on this cactus and later the population was slowly controlled so both the statements are correct next one why you never see cattle or goats browsing on calotropis this is calotropis usually this grazing animals will not be eating this calotropis so many will be available on the roadside and all in india and all when you are traveling you can see there is a lot of calotropis on the highway area but no cattle are feeding on this. The main reason, this calotropis is producing a cardiac glycoside. If they eat it, it will result in the heart issue. So that is the reason the grazing animals and all will not be feeding on calotropic. So the plant produces poisonous cardiac glycoside. So understand, when predators are eating the prey the prey also have some mechanism or adaptation to get away from the predators one of them is this only producing some chemicals that will make these predators to stay away from them or else there are several other adaptation like camouflage so camouflage is shown by some animals in order to escape from the predators only by the frog you can see leaf insect monarch butterfly so some mimicry and all is also seen in some organism you know mimicry that means here an organism will be imitating a model so model will be some dangerous organism distasteful or else the it can be poisonous so they will try to have a body pattern same as this model so what happen is predators will think that this is that real organism they won't be eating it that is what is happening in case of mimicry there is a person who mimic a model so like that they will try to escape from the predators so so many things are seen in the prey population in order to get away from the predators even plants you can see some will be producing thorn that is also to stay away from the grazing animals so these are some characters seen in the prey population in order to escape from the predators next one two different species cannot live for a long duration in the same niche or habitat this law is competitive exclusion principle so two organism which have the same feeding habitat they cannot coexist you can see there can be competition between them it can be unrelated species also that is flamingos and the fishes they are competing for the same food and you can see one will be affected like that two organism which has different feed, sorry same feeding habitat or living in the same niche they can compete for the resources and slowly slowly the one which is more competent they will survive and their numbers will increase the other one will slowly become extinct the same thing happened to abington tortoise in galapagos island you know that because of the less feeding efficiency of the tortoise when the goats were introduced in that island because of the less feeding efficiency of the tortoise and the greater feeding efficiency of the goat the goat started dominating slowly slowly the tortoise number started declining and they become extinct so two organism which is having the same feeding habitat they cannot coexist one will dominate and they will become more adaptable and the other will become extinct that was actually said in the ghost competitive exclusion principle next one on the rocky sea coast of scotland the larger and competitively superior barnacle balanus dominates the intertidal area and excludes the smaller barnacle chathamallus from this zone so when one organism is present that actually competitate with the other one and the other one's population start decreasing this is also example of competition so this is balanus as well as the chathamallus which is an example of competitive sorry competition next one two species competing for the same resource 
can avoid competition by choosing different habitat. So what goes competitive exclusion principle was telling if two organism are feeding on the same resources slowly the one which has more feeding efficiency will dominate and the other will become extinct. Whereas Mac Arthur has said about resource partitioning where two organism if they are competing for the same resource they can avoid competition by choosing different feeding habitat about wabblers only he was telling so this is resource partitioning which was supported by Mac Arthur next is about parasitism you may be knowing what is parasitism where one organism is benefited and the other is harmed this parasite will be living on the body of another organism and they will be deriving all the benefits from other. So that is parasitism. One other example of parasitism given in NCRT is brood parasitism. You may be knowing what is brood parasitism. Cuckoo bird. They will be laying egg in the next of crow. So what happens is this crow will be not able to identify that egg because it resembled the crow's egg itself. So slowly, slowly when it is hatching, they will be sitting on that. They will be incubating the egg and all. When it hatches also, it won't be able to identify. But slowly at the end only they can identify. It's not the crow, it's the quail. So that is brood parasitism. So brood parasitism in bird is an example of parasitism in which the parasitic bird, the cuckoo bird, that will be laying its egg in the next of host. And the host incubates them. Then during the course of evolution egg of the parasite bird had evolved into resembled the host egg in size and color to reduce the chance of the host being detecting the foreign egg and removing them from the next so both the statement here are correct hope you understood regarding the brood parasitism next is about which of the following Statement is or are incorrect. Liver fluke, a parasite, depends on intermediate host to complete its life cycle. You may be knowing about liver fluke that is coming in flatworms, Placti helminthus. This liver fluke is a digenetic parasite. It completes its life cycle in two hosts. And here the intermediate host that is coming in them can be snail. So that statement is correct only. Then, so parasite you should understand, they have so many adaptation like having how, uh, in the mouth they will be having some hooks or suckers to attach to the host organism, deriving the nutrients from the organism, digestive system is absent, anaerobic, like that so many adaptations are there for the parasite, that also you should learn. Then, malarial parasite needs a vector, mosquito, to spread to other host organism. Malarial parasite you might have learned in human health and diseases. Name is Plasmodium, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium malariae. In that the most malignant is Plasmodium falciparum. It completes its life cycle in two hosts. One is female anopheles mosquito. Female anopheles mosquito is having a proboscis. The main function of the proboscis is to take the blood meal. So why they take the blood meal is to make the egg case and all. So here, they will complete the life cycle in the mosquito as well as human. So gamete formation etc. will be taking place in the human. They multiply in the RBC of humans as well as the liver. And another blood meal when taken by a mosquito, inside the mosquito's gut only fertilization and the sporozoid formation etc. take place. So like this, those organism which completes its life cycle in two hosts that is called digenetic parasite. I can tell Plasmodium is also a digenetic parasite. Then, in case of brood parasitism, the egg of parasites, the egg of parasitic birds are, actually that statement is missing, let me add, the egg of parasitic birds are incubated by the host. They are incubated by host. So, that statement is correct actually, that was missing, okay. Now, a population of frogs protected from all the predators would increase indefinitely 
so that is also correct if there is no predator surely the frog population will keep on increasing so none of these are wrong statement all the statements are correct actually there was a little bit in the third one anyway all the options are correct hope you got all the statement now let me move to the next one so these are the different type of parasite that you might have learned so parasite means they will be growing on the body of a host organism and they will be deriving all the nutrients from the host so slowly slowly only they will affect the host organism and they have so many adaptation like they may be having hooks suckers etc in order to attach to the host organism digestive system may be absent they usually absorb the nutrients and all sometimes through the body surface and they may be anaerobic also these are shown by the parasite and anyway there are two parasites so here in the diagram you can see these all are parasite they are having hooks suckers and all then this is hirudin area that is leech about leech also you should understand it's a blood sucking ectoparasite so one which is growing outside the body of the host that is actually called as ectoparasite whereas if it is growing inside the body of the host that is actually called endoparasite you might have learned about ascaris in human health chapter that is actually causing problem in the intestine causing ascariasis when this uh, ascaris lumbricoids and all are multiplying inside the small intestine they can block the small intestine they will grow nicely our digestive enzyme cannot break them because their body is getting covered by a thick cuticle so that happens in case of ascariasis that is caused by the multiplication of these worms that is ascaris lumbricoids then so this ascaris is an endoparasite then cascuta cascuta is a partially heterotrophic plant that you might have learned from grade 11 itself so that is also a ectoparasite ecto means outside the body then head loss on our head you can see lice ticks all these are coming in the animals as well as humans all these are ectoparasite example then liver fluke that is endoparasite then plasmodium that is also an endoparasite it's not found outside the body it is actually seen inside the body of a host organism now next one read the given examples of animals interaction an orchid growing as an epiphyte on mango branch so epiphyte means growing on another plant so a plant is growing on another plant for getting support and all so here this plant is actually getting benefited then barnacles is growing on the back of a whale that is epizoic barnacles that is growing on the back of a whale is epizoic the here the whale is unaffected barnacles actually get a support then clownfish living among the stinging tentacles of sea anemone so you know sea anemone they will be coming under nidaria on in between the tentacles only you can see this clownfish will be going around in order to stay away from the predators so this stinging cell the nidoblast or nidocyte is actually located on the tentacle of sea anemone that will protect the clownfish and they are not going to get any benefit but the clownfish is getting benefited the other one is uh, unaffected then the cattle egrets foraging close to the grazing cattle so when the birds are walking you can see some insects will be jumping out that is sorry the when the cattle are working the insects that are jumping out is eaten by the birds and all so all these are example of common salism so just look at the common salism orchid growing on a mango tree then on the head of a whale the barnacles are actually growing then egret and cattle then this is the clownfish that is found in between the tentacles of sea anemone hope you got this much now coming to the next question which of the following exhibit mutualism mutualism you should understand both the organism will be benefited that is actually called as mutualism so it's a symbiotic relation which is obligatory and where both are benefited that is mutualism 
First example, mycorrhiza living on the roots of higher plants. So, in plant kingdom chapter in grade 11, you might have learned about pinus. In the root of pinus and all, some fungus will be growing around. So, some fungus you can see, they will be growing around the root of higher plants. Even microbes chapter it is there. So, this symbiotic association of the fungi as well as the root of higher plant is called mycorrhizae. Both are benefited. Here, the surface area of the root is actually increasing due to the growth of this cotton-like fungus. So, it helps in absorption of more water and minerals. In the second thing, in return they are getting what? In return they will get food from the plants. So, both are actually benefited. Even they will be acting as trichoderma like fungus and all. You can see they will be protecting the root from pathogens. Glomus and all will increase the absorption of phosphate. Glomus, remember glomus, that will increase the absorption of phosphate from the soil. So, that is there in microbes chapter also. So, mycorrhiza is the symbiotic association of fungus with the root of higher plants like pinus. So, that is an example of mutualism. Then, vas pollinating the fig inflorescence. So, completion of life cycle of wasp and the fig, they depend on each other. So, here the fig get pollinated and the wasp can complete its larva, most, uh, sorry, the larva's life cycle inside the fig and all. That is also an example of mutualism. It's a floral reward that is given by the fig. Then, sea anemone often found on the shell of hermit crab. So, here the hermit crab is getting protected whereas sea anemone is taken to new sites for feeding and all. So, like that both are getting benefited. So, all the three relations that I have explained here, you can see they are depending upon each other. So, this is an example of mutualism. All the given things are example of mutualism. So, hope you got all the questions nicely and the topics from ecosystem as well as organism and population. So, these are the important topic and expected areas from mutualism, commensalism, the relations and all you can expect some question and brood parasitism that is an expected area as well as the examples, examples of predation, parasitism, commensalism, competition. Then the advantages of predation and the adaptations of the prey population shown against the predators. All these are also some expected area. Then the ghost competitive exclusion principle, resource partitioning. These are also an expected area from the chapter. So, learn about the adaptation shown by the plants in order to stay away from the predators like the calotropis or thorns or the camouflage, all that adaptations. Then, some examples of predators that was uh, used in biocontrol also, you should learn. So, biocontrol that you are learning in microbes chapter that you should connect with this topic of predation. So that's all about the topics from organism and population. With that, I'm winding up my session. Okay then, bye.